So I'm Tasman Rosenfeld. I'm an undergraduate student at Yale University where I study paleontology and geobiology. In other words, I study the origins, evolution, and distribution of life through space and time. Today I'm going to be talking to you all about the importance of standing up for the little guys. Why we need to conserve little animals like that condotto stub-footed toad. Now before I dive into the meat of what I want to tell you about, I need to set the stage in your minds so that you can be most receptive for the message that I wish to share. And in order to do that, I need you to think about perspective. I need you to think about how the way you view the world is unique to you. And the way that you interact with your environment, you do so in a way that nobody else can do. No other human being can do it in exactly the same way. And now I need you to recognize that that phenomenon can be scaled up to the species level. No other species of animal interacts with the world and its environment in the same way that Homo sapiens does. And likewise, we as Homo sapiens will never know what it's like to experience the world and interact with our environment in the way that all the other animals do. And the differences between the way that we interact with our environment and the way we see the world is at its core rooted in our physiology. Now let me give you some examples. So if we were to drop a rhino in the middle of this room, um, everybody might like jump back a little bit and gasp and think, wow, maybe say out loud, man, that animal is big. But you show a rhino to a pot of whales, and the whales are like, meh, I've seen bigger. Right? Now on the flip side of that coin, imagine you're walking down the sidewalk and you encounter a brick laying in the middle of the path. Absolutely inconsequential. You just step right over it. It does nothing to redefine your immediate landscape. But if you're an ant, it's a much different situation. You're an ant walking along the same path. You come up to that brick that's laying in the path, look up, and, you know, oh man, I'm going to have to expend all this energy to climb this mountain or expend the energy to walk around it or maybe I'll just double back the other way, right? And so this kind of illustrates how at the most basic level, the way that we see the world and the way we encounter things is just so closely linked to our morphology, to our biology. In these examples, it's linked to our size and the orientation of our sensory organs. In humans, we use our eyes and our hands mostly to engage with the world around us. And so, now that I've planted that seed in your mind, that seed of, of difference in perspective between taxa or groups of animals, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and ask you to think about the Everglades, that river of grass that's in our backyard here in Western Broward County. Think about the animals in the Everglades. If you're a hockey fan, maybe you think of the Florida panther. Perhaps you're thinking about our notable diversity of wetland birds and a beautiful roseate spoonbill flies into your head. I'd bet money that probably all of you in here are thinking about alligators because South Florida and the Everglades in particular is known for its abundance of alligators. And maybe if you're in the know, you're thinking about the American crocodile because the Everglades is the only place in the world where the American alligator overlaps in range with another crocodilian. That's an American crocodile from Everglades National Park. Maybe you're thinking about Burmese pythons, a recent addition to the biota of the Everglades, a non-native one. But what if I told you that there are animals in the Everglades that you've never heard of. In fact, there are animals in the Everglades that you've probably never thought would even exist. Let's explore. We're standing in the middle of a depression marsh in the southwestern Everglades. There's a white-tailed deer in front of us, as you can see. We look down, and uh, we're standing in, in inches of water, at least. There's a blanket of this green pond scum-looking stuff that covers the marshes as far as we can see. What is that? Well, that's what ecologists call periphyton. It's aggregated micro and macroalgae, aquatic plants, and other detritus in the water that really does form a blanket across these depression marshes. The animals we're seeking lie below. There are four species of aquatic salamanders in the Everglades. The first of which is the peninsula newt, Nautophthalamus viridescens peropicola. Beneath that, you can see the greater siren, siren lacertina. These animals have secondarily lost their hind limbs. And right in front of their remaining four limbs, you can see external gills. 
This signifies to us, the biologists, that these animal, animals are fully dedicated to life underwater. And aquatic salamanders in the Everglades, oh man, aquatic salamanders in the Everglades can be pretty abundant too. So this is a pretty uh, modest haul from a survey that I went on to, with some friends this summer. You can see in one of those cups a good deal of peninsula newts, um, in the other some juvenile greater sirens, and in the big white bucket down below, you can see three two-toed amphiumas. Amphiuma means these animals are of particular interest to me because through evolution, they have almost completely lost all their limbs, and they're in the process of losing their eyesight as well. They have an elaborate system of electroreceptors of their snout, and they use these, uh, these electroreceptors to detect signals from their crayfish and fish prey. But I haven't yet told you about the most special of all the salamanders in the Everglades. And it's special because it lives here and only here in the Everglades, nowhere else in the world. That's the Everglades dwarf siren, Pseudobranchus exanthus belli. This gorgeous black and white striped salamander grows to only be about four and a half inches long. And it spends its entire life living underneath that periphyton. Its whole life underneath that blanket of green pond scum, feeding on microinvertebrates and algae. We as humans, because of our physiological biases, have no idea what it would be like to live like Pseudobranchus exanthus belli. We have absolutely no idea. We can't even empathize with these animals because our biology limits that. And it's not just the Pseudobranchus here in the Everglades that live these mysterious lives that are so foreign to us. They're actually all around. There's the scarlet king snake that lives in the pockets in between the, pr the fronds of cabbage, cabbage palms. It spends its whole life foraging for unsuspecting anoles and frogs. And you may actually have some scarlet king snakes in your front and backyard, but you would never know. Because, as you can see, that animal just, just travels in between the fronds and never anywhere else. There's the eastern mud snake, Ferrancia abacura abacura, which feasts solely on aquatic amphibians. In fact, those aquatic salamanders I just told you about and as such, spends a great deal of its life in and, uh, in and under the periphyton. There's the famed eastern coral snake, which I'm sure you're all familiar with because of its potent neurotoxin. But actually, these animals are just as secretive and spend pretty much their whole lives submerged under loose sandy soils and under pine needles, emerging only to feast on their next reptilian prey. But animals like this are all around the world. They're not just limited to the Everglades. They're in the Pacific lowland jungles of Colombia. This is Ufega histrionica, the harlequin poison frog. They're in the cold, oxygen-rich springs of the northeastern United States. This is a spring salamander, Gerinophilus porphyriticus. They're in the rainforests of Malaysia. That's Megafri's nazuda the Malayan horned frog in the hand of 14-year-old me. They're in the dunes of the Namib Desert of southwestern Africa. This snake, Peringae's dwarf adder, this Peringaei, spent its whole life submerged under the sand, waiting for an innocent little lizard to walk the wrong way. And as you can see, this animal is well equipped for that lifestyle. These animals are in the redwood forests of the Pacific Northwest. In this picture, you can see some of my students last year looking at the highly toxic rough skin newt, Terica granulosa, and its absolutely harmless and adorable mimic, the yellow-eyed Ensatina, Ensatina schultzi xanthopica. And now what I'm getting at here is that for every one of these animals that we're super familiar with, because of our physiology, we are much more similar to elephants and to rhinos and giraffes and to deer and to panthers than we are to these little frogs and salamanders and snakes. And because of these biases from our physiology, we can think about what it would be like to be an elephant and we can think of conserving them and protecting them because they are indeed very magnificent. But for every one of them, there's at least a thousand of the little guys. And while I finish the talk, I'll let you look for the the greater short-horned lizard that's positioned somewhere in that photo. You see, in our pursuit to preserve the natural world, which I will add is absolutely vital to our survival as a species, in that pursuit, if we continue to neglect the little guys, 
we will not only be doing ourselves a great disservice, but we will be doing our planet a great disservice because it's the little guys that form the vast bulk of the incredible and unique biodiversity that makes planet Earth unlike any other place in the whole universe. We will be making a mistake if we don't give these animals the credit that they deserve for making our world so darn special. So, thank you very much. And I hope you learned something. <laughs>